Different is better. Different is what took us from here, yes, really, to here, in over 160 countries. One of Interbrand's 100 best global brands, and BCG's 50 most innovative companies. The number one PC company in the world, for three years straight. It's not just about being different, it's about being better. Because different is what drives us. Different does it right. Different finds inspiration in the most unexpected places. Different rethinks, reimagines, and reinvents. Oh wait, before we go ahead, let us tell you about the story of Lenovo. How they succeeded in the PC market, their new leaps into the smartphone business, and our prime focus today, the acquisition of Motorola, a closer look at the financials and strategic decisions, and the way forward. Now let's rewind. Lenovo's DNA is equal part ingenuity and imagination. The humble yet momentous journey of Lenovo started in 1984 when its founders Liu Chinchai launched the company Legend from a small cabin with a startup capital of whooping $25,000. Later on, Legend changed his name, taking the first syllable of Legend and combining with the Latin word Novo to form Lenovo. During the late 1980s, Lenovo developed domestic Chinese sales, distribution and service network for foreign companies such as Apple, Toshiba and Canon as the Chinese government restricted these companies from establishing their own channels in China. This enabled Lenovo to develop a strong network in China and gain management and technology know-how which it harnessed over the years to emerge as a strong player in the same industry. Gradually, it evolved itself as a low-cost PC provider in the Chinese market. It derived its cost advantages from economies of scale, low labor cost, and in-house manufacturing specialization well supported by the vendor-managed inventory model. And of course, we cannot forget the government support and tax advantages. Having developed a strong base in China, it then adopted a protect and attack strategy for global expansion. It tried to build on its success in China, where it occupied a dominant position as the top PC vendor, while offensively it pursued international growth by leveraging acquired assets and expanding sales overseas. The prime example for this strategy was IBM's acquisition, which made Lenovo the second largest PC manufacturer in the world. As visible from the strategy graph, with its affordable price range, high service availability and durability, Lenovo had positioned itself well for corporate customers. Let's look at the performance of Lenovo after acquiring IBM PC business. After the acquisition, Lenovo's revenue grew at an average annual rate of 36% in the next 10 years and its market share grew from 5% to 21%. Lenovo's share price grew from 2 Hong Kong dollar to 8 before the 2008 crisis. However, when PC sales growth started to decline in 2010, Lenovo looked towards mobile industry. So let us first look at the dynamics of smartphone industry. For a new player to enter the smartphone industry, having high access to capital is a must requirement, as innovation, R&D and brand loyalty are barriers for entry. Lenovo already has high reserves of capital and established brand image, found it easy to enter the smartphone business. Therefore, it launched LiPhone with designs catering to the needs of Chinese market, such as using Baidu and Lenovo applications in place of Google applications. CEO Yang Zhuang Xing said Lenovo wanted to use the same strategy from its PC experience and first build market share in China before expanding globally. Leveraging on its steep learning curve and taking advantage of economies of scope from its PC and mobile business, Lenovo soon established itself as one of the top three players in Chinese smartphone market. However, to gain the much required traction abroad and following its protect and attack strategy, it had its eyes set on Motorola. Now let's try and understand why Lenovo was pining for Motorola. With a long history of 85 years, Motorola had built strategic alliances with key partners such as Oracle, SAP and Google, and had strong relationships with carriers such as Verizon and AT&T. 
Lenovo saw this as an opportunity to use Motorola's relationships to expand its presence in US. In addition, Lenovo wanted to turn around Motorola and use its brand resonance amongst customer segments in US and at the same time, they could sell a complete technology solution to their enterprise clients as well. Lenovo thought that now it had a portfolio to compete against the likes of Samsung and Apple. Therefore, Lenovo completed Motorola's acquisition in 2014. Now, let us understand the acquisition of Motorola Mobility by Lenovo from a financial and strategic viewpoint. This $2.91 billion acquisition of Lenovo was considered to be a great move by the markets. When the acquisition was completed in October 2014, the stock prices of Lenovo zoomed up to a record high for a decade at 12 Hong Kong dollars per share and rallied up to a level of 13.5 Hong Kong dollars by May 2015. The market felt that an expensive mistake by Google would now turn into a golden opportunity for this Chinese group in its expansion beyond its success in the personal computer industry. This was the second high-profile acquisition deal of Lenovo during the same month. It was felt that Google, which prides itself on employing some of the world's smartest people, miscalculated how much Motorola was worth. Let's look at the price paid by Lenovo to Google. The total purchase consideration paid was 2.91 billion US dollars, 23% paid in cash, 51% paid by way of 3-year interest-bearing promissory note, and balance 26% by way of equity stake in Lenovo. Not only did Lenovo acquire Motorola Mobility, but simultaneously as part of an aggressive expansion and diversification strategy, they also acquired IBM's data center business for 2.3 billion US dollars. But how did Lenovo pay for all these acquisitions? It borrowed liberally from banks, thus piling up debt from a level of 844 million US dollars in 2014 to 2.1 billion US dollars in 2016. Five months after the acquisition was completed, high growth in the PC industry boosted Lenovo's revenues for 2015. The company was bullish on growth and found itself ready to lead the next wave of innovation. The company's business grew in America and Europe, but its hold in China started to weaken. While the company's operating earnings grew a whooping 25%, Lenovo had already started feeling the burden of high finance costs on its bottom line. In 2016, the macro economy grew challenging and global markets in the PC industry were soon reaching maturity. Lenovo saw a sudden decline in its shipments over 2016 with visible loss of market share in China. Revenues from PC business were hit the most. While operating margins fell by 51%, Lenovo's bottom line turned negative. Towards third quarter of 2016, with continued slump in shipments, Lenovo's stock prices crashed more than a third to a low of 6.2 Hong Kong dollars. Its price to forward earnings ratio deteriorated to 7.8 times, the lowest in its trading history. This occurred due to weaker than expected PC shipments and inability to gain traction in the smartphone market, which Lenovo had been trying to acquire in order to replace declining PC sales. What could be the reason for this surprising outcome on a bet that everyone was so confident about a year back? We will analyze this strategic acquisition from three perspectives – financial, integration and market strategy. Did Lenovo pay a lot for the assets it acquired from Google? When Google sold Motorola Mobility, it realized a net gain of 740 million US dollars, retained most of the meaningful patents, and also earned additional income of 254 million US dollars for IP licensing agreement with Lenovo. Ever since Google had acquired Motorola in May 2012, it had only incurred operating losses. The first time Google made a profit with Motorola was upon its sale to Lenovo. 
they paid a billion dollar premium over the value of assets acquired from Google. The justification for such high premium can only be the overconfidence of Lenovo in being able to repeat its IBM success story. The high premium for Motorola acquisition coupled with the IBM service business acquisition resulted in huge long-term debts and thus led to an increase in interest expense and decreased net margins, which ultimately led to a decrease in cash reserves. Another major reason for the setback was the poor integration of the two companies. After buying Motorola, Lenovo appointed one of its longtime PC executives, Chen Zudong, as global head of smartphone business. Motorola's president, Rick Osterloh, reported into Zudong, the latter being disproportionately focused on bringing Motorola models to China market. Tensions emerged as product features and delivery timings were unilaterally adjusted from China. For instance, the Moto X4's shutterproof model, originally designed for the US market, was rolled out in China. However, it failed to delight the end consumer because of the incompatibilities of an Android model customized to work in China. Apart from that, Motorola executives were worried about losing momentum in US and Brazil because Lenovo's marketing spends in the US market were not aggressive enough to sustain its brand image and customer experience. Building a good mobile device is not the key to winning in smartphone wars, especially in the Western markets. It needs to be complemented by aggressive advertising and branding spend. Eventually, Motorola executive Rick Osterloh left to join Google, presaging a wave of departures of other Motorola executives. Next, we examine the China strategy of Lenovo. As recently as the beginning of 2014, Lenovo was the number two smartphone brand in China. But in just two years, Lenovo's rank fell to number 11 due to tough competition from local brands like Xiaomi, Huawei, Oppo, and Vivo. One of the major reasons for this downturn in China market was the shift away from carrier-led smartphone sales to direct and open market sales. In 2014, Chinese government regulators ordered state-run carriers to reduce their marketing expenses, which includes smartphone subsidies. This shift hit Lenovo hard, as it was dependent on carriers to sell most of its smartphones. Lenovo's competitors have successfully leveraged alternate sales channels to beat Lenovo. Huawei, for example, only uses online sales to deliver a lean, low-cost distribution process. Another example is Ovo's 200,000 retail stores in China, which despite being costly to operate, gives the vendor an opportunity to upsell in-store and develop direct customer relationships. Another reason for weak performance in China can be attributed to ambiguous brand positioning and undistinguished value proposition. On examining the competitive positioning of other smartphone brands, unlike Lenovo, most of the budget Chinese brands like Xiaomi had a clear low-end target segment. Moreover, Lenovo was not able to compete in mobile features against its competition in the low and medium price brackets. Thus, it was not creating enough value in the minds of its target customers. Summarizing our strategy analysis, we conclude that in the Motorola acquisition, Lenovo failed in its core strategy of protecting its hold in the home market and attacking in the foreign markets. In its saturated home market, it pushed another brand to compete and cannibalize it. In its foreign market, it failed to maintain and grow the brand. How can Lenovo dust it off? We have two recommendations for Lenovo. Firstly, Lenovo should take advantage of their success in emerging markets by deriving penetration through traditional sales channels established from their PC division. Further, they should focus on delivering a unique value proposition in enterprise customer segment by integrating PC, smartphone and data center products into a complete enterprise solution. Secondly, in order to succeed in the two biggest global smartphone markets, Lenovo needs to align their smartphone business into a more simple and streamlined product portfolio. 
A linear product portfolio will help economize operations and reap benefits from economies of scale. This will also release cash flows for investing in branding and product innovation.